Last Saturday, we had No Regrets, which is a men's conference, and Steve Sonderman, who leads it up, he gave us 10 things that we'll, you will never hear at a, at a men's conference. And uh, number 10 was like, pass me the lip gloss. Can I borrow your lip gloss? <laughs> One was, uh, do you want to go to the bathroom together? And this wasn't on the list, but I don't think there's ever going to be a men's pajama party. <laughs> All right. Can, can we stand together in honor of God's word? We are in a series in the book of Luke. We actually will be in it all year long. Um, and uh, we're just kind of moving through. We're, on, uh, we're in chapter 5. We're going to do the first 11 verses, and I think we're going to have it. Yeah, there we go. Beautiful. Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear. From now on you will be catching men. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, we humble ourselves before you as a congregation. We ask you to open our hearts, open our eyes, speak into our lives. Lord, you have chosen to use the foolishness of preaching to bring your own, your own word, your own heart to bear on things. Lord, you have chosen to use human beings and in a mystery bring heaven to earth through preaching. And we just ask you to do what only you can do. Please, God, help us to see Jesus today, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The title of the message today is All In Again. All In Again. It's really important as we... Uh, Think about this passage. There are three bodies of water, or three names for one body of water. The Sea of Galilee is the same of, as Lake Gennesaret, which is the same as the Sea of Tiberias. One lake, one body of water, it's called three different things. And so when we read in different gospels similar stories and it looks like they might be somewhere else, they're not. It's just that that body of water had three different names. And one of the things we've been talking about in Luke is the importance of putting it together with Mark and Matthew. They are called the synoptic gospels, which means to view together, that all three of them tell essentially the same story from different viewpoints, and, but to get all of the details of what actually happens, to get all of the dialogue, you actually need to compare Gospels to get the full thing. And in both Matthew 
and Mark's gospel, this scene is much shorter, but it has this statement that Jesus made to them before it says they left everything. He says, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And then both Matthew and Mark say exactly what Luke says here. They responded to that call by leaving everything. They were all in for God. They had left everything else behind, and they were all in following Jesus after this calling. There are three important things about our lives. Somebody, uh, Dale Crawl, uh, preached at, at Grace Church a few weeks ago, and I got to listen to the CDs, and he gave this quote. It is almost impossible to overestimate the unimportance of most things. I'm going to say it again. It is almost impossible to overestimate the unimportance of most things. Most of the things that go on on this planet are really not important. Most of the conversation that happens on this planet are really not important. There are actually very, very few things that are really important. I want to give you three things that are really important in this life. First, to believe in Jesus. When I say believe in Jesus, I mean to believe in Jesus, not to believe that he existed, that he walked on the earth, that there was such a guy, to believe in the, what he said and the principles of Christianity. When I, when I say believe in Jesus, I mean to believe that he is your Savior and Lord. It is a very personal thing. It is from the heart. It is between you and God, and you really, truly trusting Jesus Christ. How this happens is very individual. How God comes and arranges you to come to the place where you are beyond yourself and your own resources and actually encounter him as Savior and Lord. Very, very personal. Here's how it happened for Peter. Peter's a fisherman. He's, he's a hard worker. And the Bible says that he had fished all night and they had caught nothing. God had so arranged this meeting so that it starts with real life not working. This is what he does. This is what he does for a living. He is frustrated. They are cleaning the nets. It's the next morning. They, he's probably worried about getting back out there or going getting a nap first or moving on. And Jesus comes into the midst of what's not working for us. Peter says, Lord, he says, go out, put, put the nets out. And, and he says, Lord, we've, we were out there all night long and we caught nothing. So that's my question. Is life working for you? Is your life working? Or does it feel like you're working real hard to make life work and it's not working? You're trying to keep things going. Maybe that's even what, you br what brought you to church today. Is you've tried everything else. Has it really come to this? We're coming to church. We tried everything else. Life isn't working. Jesus tells him to put the nets out. Even though Simon Peter 
disagrees with him as a fisherman. And they make this catch that is so amazing and so big that the, the boats are, can barely hold it. And Peter gets a revelation in that moment of who Jesus is and what his own heart looks like before God. To this point, he's called him master. Now he calls him Lord. And he says, depart from me, Lord. I am a wicked man. I'll tell you what, it, it takes the grace of God to see your own sin. It takes the grace of God to see not just I'm not perfect, not just I've sinned a few times and, 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 and well, I never said I was perfect, but what we're saying when we say I, I've never said I'm perfect is we're, we're not perfect, but we're pretty good. We're pretty good people. And we are, even though we might not have everything down, we, we have good intentions. Well, the Bible says something different. The Bible says that even our righteous deeds before a holy God are filthy. That everything that we do as human beings is stained. The Bible says that on our own, we are sinners that would have to depart from God. From a holy God. But the gospel is that Jesus came because God loves us. Even though sin separated us from his presence, sin never separated you from the heart of God. God so loved you, so loved me, that he sent Jesus to come down here to die in our place. God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And Jesus invites sinners to come and be his. Sinners to come and allow him to cleanse them and wash them and make them. And so that's the invitation of God to all of us, is to believe in Jesus. It's really important. You don't get there by yourself. God has to knock on your door first. You would never even know there was. It's not a matter of you choosing Jesus. That's not how it works. Jesus has to choose you first. He has to knock on your life first. The love of God has to come to you first. And then you can make a response to him. Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? And he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says this, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. You didn't figure this out yourself, Peter, and no human being explained this to you. The, you are blessed. The Father has showed you this. No one comes to Jesus except the Father draw him. No one really sees the depth of their need without the Holy Spirit showing you. You are and I are indeed sinners that need to be saved. It's a little rough on 21st century ears. We, we, we think we're pretty with it. And no, we need to be saved. Praise God. There will be a chance for that at the end of the service. Really important that you believe in Jesus. But secondly, it's really important that you follow Jesus. To those who already believed in him. He's already had the encounter of believing in Jesus and calling him Lord. He then says, come, follow me. And it says they left everything and followed him. It is possible to believe in Jesus and not follow him. The, uh, the rich young ruler, this is in Luke chapter 18. He comes to Jesus and says, Lord, how do I inherit eternal life? And he tells Jesus all of the rules that he has been keeping since his youth. And Jesus says to him, you lack one thing. Sell everything, give it to the poor, 
and follow me. The Bible says that he was sad because he was wealthy. And he walked away sad. And then Jesus turns to his disciples and said, it's really hard for rich people. It's really hard for rich people to make it. Because see, Jesus says, follow me, I will make you. And when you are self-made, when, you, when you're kind of proud of who you are and what you've got, Jesus, in our American minds, we think, I've got a lot to give God. God could really use this person. And Jesus says, no, uh, I'm going to start over. So sell everything. Let's get rid of everything you made for yourself. And follow me. I'll make you what I want you to be. We're not, we're not using what you made yourself. I'm going to make you something by my grace that is beautiful and powerful. And I don't need what you've made to this point. So just let go of that. And it's very hard when you're a self-made person and you're very proud of who you become. It's very hard to follow Jesus because it means letting go and letting him make you. Jesus doesn't chase him down. Jesus doesn't lessen the cost. And then in, in Luke 9, we have these people that Jesus says, follow me to. And once again, they believe he's the Lord. And the first one says in Luke 9, he says, Lord, permit me first to bury my father. And Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead. You come and follow me. Now that, it's a little harsh on our ears. It sounds like dad is already dead and, you know, the funeral is in three days. That is absolutely not the case here. What he's saying is, I want to follow you, but my dad is dying and I need to be with him until he dies. And then I will follow you. Lord, permit me first to be with my father who's dying, ailing. Then, then I will follow you. And there's somebody else there that says, Lord, I, I, I want to follow you. And, and, or Jesus says to another guy, come and follow me. And he says, uh, first, let me, permit me first, Lord, to say goodbye to my family. And he says to this, follow me. Anybody who puts their hand to the plow and then turns back is not worthy of me. Does anybody see the problem with saying, calling Jesus Lord, and then saying the words, permit me first? Lord, me first. They don't go together very well, do they? Lord means Lord. Lord means there's no condition. Lord means whatever you say is what I do. And me first doesn't go very well with Lord. Um, this whole issue of leaving family was the big issue for me. I believed in Jesus. I had come to Christ the end of my freshman year at college. I believed in Jesus. He was in me. Um, but I wasn't a follower yet. I didn't even know I wasn't a follower. I was just, I believed in Jesus and I would have my life and I was doing my thing. And, um, but family, very, very important to me. And, uh, I had an encounter with the Lord where he was essentially saying, what's it going to be? Because I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt, if I really followed Jesus, that it would, it would cost me the opinion of my family. Because I'd been in many of those conversations. My family, we thought, it, it's fine to believe in Jesus. Uh, it's fine to go to church. But don't be a Jesus freak. A Jesus freak is defined as somebody who talks about Jesus when it's not Sunday morning. Jesus is private, and there are people that talk about Jesus all the time, everywhere, and it's like they're obsessed with Jesus, and don't ever become one of those people. And 
the Lord was calling me to follow him. I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that my family was not going to like it and they were going to wonder what I was in if I really left everything and followed Jesus. I chose to follow him and exactly what I thought would happen, happened. We talk about two women. The first one, we were down on the uh, campus mall it was a Saturday night. Our college and career group used to meet down there for worship every Saturday night. And what we would do is we would worship and we would use the music to draw people. And then we would talk to people about their faith. We would just stir up conversations. And I'm just a very, very young Christian. I'm very excited about Jesus and what he's doing in my life. And, and I'm talking to this woman about Jesus and, and how wonderful he is and, and that she needs to try Jesus. And she's like, stop. I've already tried Jesus and it didn't work. And so she walks away and I'm just a young believer. I don't, I don't know anything. And I'm like, God, how could this possibly be? I know, I know you. I've tasted you. I've tasted your goodness. How could she have tried you and then walked away? And this is one of the very first times that I believe God spoke to me. And all I mean by that, I didn't hear anything audible, but a, a series of thoughts, spontaneous thoughts came into my mind that were way better than anything I would have thought of. And it was just so clear, and it was so immediate. And here was the stream of thoughts. That woman never followed me. She tried to get me to follow her. Yeah, that's a whole sermon right there, isn't it? <laughs> you can believe in Jesus, but not really follow him. Not really leave everything and follow him and... You, it, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Lots of people have tried this. And it doesn't work. At some point, you're going to have to choose. So here's another woman. This is a, a woman in Montevideo. She's given me permission in the past to share this testimony. And she, uh, her son died in a tragic car accident as an 18-year-old. And in the midst of it, her whole life got turned over and it ended up that the funeral was done at our church for a number of different reasons. It was absolutely jammed out. But she had an encounter with Jesus. Powerful encounter with Jesus. Problem was, is she was still living with a guy. And he was not ready to follow Jesus. And he really loved her, and he didn't mind if she was into that, but he wasn't going that direction. So she, she would come in and talk to me about, about this guy and about this situation. And do, do I have to break up with this guy? Because I'm the only link he has to Christianity. And, and he keeps telling me that, that maybe he'll come around and, and, and that please stay with me. I need you. You're the only Jesus I've got. And, and she's between a rock and a hard place about what, what, what does God expect of me because I really, I really love this man. And, and uh, I'm just like, yeah, you, you need to leave him. You, you need to leave him. You, you're, and at some point, you're going to have to make that decision. It seems like it's the loving thing to stay with him. I said, really, the only hope he's really got is if you leave him so that he can actually have to encounter God. Right now, you're his, his little God, small g. He can't see the real God because he's got you. You need to break up with him. And so she, we would go for a while, and she was at church every Sunday. She was so excited about Jesus. And then we'd, she set up an appointment, she'd come in, and it was always the same thing. It was always about, you know, I tried to leave, and then he did this, 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 and now we're back together, and da 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 And it just, it, it, it just, he was very, very persistent, and he loved her so much, and da-da-da. And I'm like, 
And she, but she always wanted a different answer. I'm like, no, you, you need to leave him. You, you really, you really, I mean, do what you want to. You're a free person, but you, you need to leave him. And finally she did it. She was tough. She made a tough choice. She left everything for Jesus. What happened with this woman? <laughs> she became the happiest person in our church. She became a one-woman evangelistic tour in Montevideo. She just glowed with God. Everywhere she went, she glowed with God. She couldn't do enough for people. Just so generous, so healing, so tender. And it was just a burning, shining light for Jesus. And she ended up getting married to this amazing guy. I got to do the wedding. And, and, and to this day, they are absolute game changers in the kingdom. They are all in, all the time for Jesus. Everybody knows it. They are absolute pillars in the faith. Just an amazing story. But it started when she followed Jesus. Not just, didn't just believe in Jesus. She followed Jesus. <clears throat> and then finally, third important thing. Believe in Jesus. Follow Jesus. Number three, third most important thing. Help other people follow Jesus. Jesus says what he's going to make people. Jesus loves people so much that what he's making you is a fisher of other people. Very central to who you are is you are now a witness for Jesus Christ. Once you follow Jesus, part of what you become is somebody that is now your main assignment is to help other people find Jesus. You are a fisher of people. This is in your identity. If you're following Jesus, if you're letting him make you what he wants to make you, you now have part of your calling is to be a witness and to help other people follow. And you can't understand your life outside of this. We think our life is about, you know, whether I go to this college or that college or work at this job or that job or get married to this person or that person. And all that's fine. But it's not the really big picture. The big picture is, is eternity's coming. We are a vapor down here and people need to get saved. And God sees things clearly. We don't. We're so close to this life that this life seems so important and there's so much going on and so, so urgent. And God doesn't see things that way. So he's made you a fisher of other people. You and, you and I are supposed to be part of something that's helping other people find Jesus. That's really essentially what the church is, isn't it? We're a light in this world. We're salt in this world. We're supposed to help other people follow Jesus. So those are the three important things. And now we get to point two, which is all in again. All in again. So here's what happens. So Peter's all in. And he's following Jesus. He's left everything. He's left fishing. He's left the nets. He's left everything that he made himself. And now he's following Jesus. And he's learning how to pray for people. And he's learning how to walk in authority. And, and he's doing all the stuff. And, and Jesus changes his name from Simon to Peter, which means rock. And, and he says to Peter, I'm giving you the keys. You're going to be a leader in unlocking the kingdom. And Peter is very excited now about this new identity in Jesus. So they get to the Last Supper. And Jesus says something very disturbing to them. Luke 22, he says that uh, somebody is going to betray me. One of you is going to betray me. And they, they, they start talking amongst themselves. The disciples start talking and pretty soon the conversation <laughs> changes from who is the worst among us to who is the best among us. And they get going about which one is the greatest 
Which one of them is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God? And Jesus does a time out and he says, uh, the greatest is not those, it's not like this earth, it's not like you trying to get everybody to serve you. The greatest is actually the one who serves the most. And then he looks at Peter and some tells me that Peter had won that conversation of which one is going to be the greatest. And he looks at Peter and he says, by the way, Peter, um, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny that you even know me three times. To which Peter says, I don't think so. He says, Lord, I am, I am willing to die for you. Mark's gospel, which is written through the eyes of Peter, is the most explicit about how bad it is. That Peter actually says, all of these might fall away, but not me. You're looking at number one right here, Jesus. Luke 22, 55 and 56. But when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him. Peter says to a girl, a young girl, a servant girl, no, I wasn't with him. Three times. Three times he denies him and he looks, Jesus looks over at, Jesus is on trial at this point between the Sanhedrin and he looks over at Peter after the cock crows and the Bible says that Peter weeps bitterly. When Jesus is raised from the dead, he says, they say, go, the angel says, go tell the disciples and if you want to get all that they said, you've got to use all the Gospels. And Mark's Gospel, once again, the most explicit about Peter's role, because it's really written through the eyes of Peter, what the angels said, the full of what they said is, go tell the disciples and Peter that I'm risen from the dead. Peter had gone very dark after the denials. The one who thought he was a great leader actually denied the Lord three times, it explicitly denied him with cursing, one of the Gospels says, swears up and down with cursing that he doesn't even know Jesus. And he goes very, very dark. And the Bible tells us in Luke's Gospel that on resurrection day, there was a private appearance to, Jesus, to Peter. Paul references it as well in 1 Corinthians 15 when he's listing the resurrection appearances there's one just to Peter. Now it's funny because that's the one we have no information about. We know it was one on one. It was just Jesus and Peter. Very, very intimate. But Peter was restored as a believer. He was restored as as I still belong to Jesus, Jesus loves me, I'm, I'm still in, I'm still on my way to heaven. Praise God. But he's not restored as a disciple until John chapter 21, and I want to look at that for a moment. After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. Once again, same as the Sea of Galilee, same as the Lake of Gennesaret. It's the same body of water. So this is, this is the same water where Peter was originally called. And he manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will come with you. They went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the day was now breaking, okay, so they have fished all night long and caught nothing. 
It's, it's morning. Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, children, you do not have any fish, do you? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find a catch. So they cast and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. How many know they're experiencing a little deja vu right here? They don't recognize that it's Jesus. They're, they're told by him they've caught nothing. It's not working, is it? They've gone back to fishing. It's their first time back fishing that we know of. And it's not working for them. And he brings attention to that and says, put the, put the nets out on the other side. And they make a catch that's massive. And John says, it's the Lord. Peter jumps out. He's so excited. He swims in and, and they come in and, and Jesus is, uh, has got a fire made and they're gathered around it. And here we, here we go in, in verse 15. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to, said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. There is so much happening in this passage. First, we have got a recreation of the Last Supper. It says that it was after supper, after they had taken the cup. that Jesus had told him about the denials. You're going to deny me three times. So the last time they had a supper together with Jesus was the last supper after they were done eating. This was the conversation where Jesus had said, you're going to deny me three times. And Jesus says, Simon, do you love me more than these? I used to think he was talking about fish and fishing. Uh, no, I think he's talking about the other disciples. I think he's bringing back the last time they were together after dinner talking. Peter said, all of these will fall away, but I won't. Simon, is it true that you love me more than these? Now, we miss it in the English Bible, and I hate to say that because... Almost always you can follow in our English what the Greek says, but not here. Because in the Greek, it says that Jesus says this, Peter, do you agape me more than these? Agape is the word for God's love. It's self-sacrificial love. And Peter says back, Lord, yes, Lord, I phileo you. Phileo means having a fond affection for somebody. And notice that he doesn't even say, I phileo you, yes, Lord, I phileo you more than all these. He, does, he doesn't even mention the other disciples. Peter, do you agape me more than these? Are you willing to die for me? Are you willing to sacrifice? Peter, he doesn't actually call him Peter. He goes back to his old name. He calls him Simon, son of John, every time. He doesn't go to the new name, the rock name. He says, Simon, son of John, do you agape me more than these? Peter says, Lord, you know all things. I phileo you. I have a fond affection for you. The second time Jesus says, Peter, do you agape me? Peter comes back. Lord, you know all things. I phileo you. 
The third time, Jesus says, Simon Peter, or, or Simon, son of John, do you phileo me? And then Peter gets mad. <laughs> Jesus has brought attention to how shallow his love is. And he says, you know, you know everything. You know that's all that's in this tank right now is phileo. And Jesus says, see, I think Simon in his own mind is he's back with Jesus. He's, he's good to go with Jesus, but he's no longer going to be the, 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 the leader. He's no longer going to fish for men. He's, he's, he's no longer going to be that disciple that is helping other people because he feels like he's kind of disqualified because his love is so shallow and so little and he's denied the Lord. And Jesus sets up this fire and just like he denied him three times, he affirms three times, Peter, I know you only have phileo. Feed my sheep, shepherd my flock, tend my lambs. Peter, the call is still on you. It was never about you. It was never about what I thought you could do or the love you could give. It was always about me making you something. And we're still on, Peter. You denied me three times around a fire. I'm calling you back three times around this fire. And Peter, Peter the day is coming, he says. Up till this point, you've done what you wanted to do. You've preserved yourself. But the day is coming where you will go where you don't want to go. You will be taken away, and indeed, you will die for me. And then he looks at him and he says, follow me. You'd think if Jesus has already said, follow you, follow me, and you left everything to follow him, that he wouldn't have to say it again. But how many know that it's not just going all in. You have to go all in again. Life happens. Disappointments happen. Sins happen. Shame happens. Falls happen. All kinds of things happen. And then God comes and says, are you still all in? Are you going to go all in again? We, uh, we had come through such a difficult time in Boston, and there was a, a group of 30 that didn't like me and started meeting privately and tried to get rid of me, and it came to this big meeting where they were going to decide whether they were going to have a vote, and I couldn't even be in the meeting, and and people, everybody got to tell their stuff. And, and it turned out I passed the vote, so I stayed. But uh, it, was, it was just such a difficult place. And God led us on to the next place. And the problem was, in the next place, we, we had moved from Boston to Montevideo. Uh, in, in 1997, I'm at National Convention. And in, in my heart, I just don't know if I can go all in again. I'm all in for Jesus. I love Jesus. I'm so good to go with Jesus. The gospel is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. I'm so glad I'm going to heaven. I don't think I could do the all in for ministry anymore. I, I just, I did the math. I spent three and a half years in Boston and the, it was a mess. It was, it was, it was a disaster. And I, you know, the devil got in and darkness got, I mean, you can give all the reasons why it happened. But I just couldn't see how it wouldn't happen again, wherever I was. And the next pastor at Foss, he was the interim pastor. His name is Kenton Kinnett. It was the only time I ever met him. He sat down to me with me at lunch. In the middle of lunch, he just says, I've got a word from God for you. God wants you to know that what happened in Foston will never happen to you again in your ministry. And something happened in that little moment where, where my heart got healed enough that I could go all in again. But what had happened for me hadn't happened with my wife. We were on our way to Madison. And I think we were candidating at Mad City at the time. This is 11 years later. And she says, and I got her permission to share this. I would never share this if she hadn't given me permission. And she said, uh, I, want, I want to ask your forgiveness for, uh, for Montevideo. I said, what do you mean? 
She said, after Faustin, I, I just, uh, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't be there completely in ministry anymore. I just decided I was going to take care of my kids. I was going to take care of my family. And I just kind of guarded myself from the church and church people and ministry and all that thing, all that happened there. And I, I, and she did get better as we went on, but she said, I just, I really, I really held back. Sometimes it's not you personally getting hurt. It's somebody you love getting hurt. And you don't pull back from Jesus. You just pull back from the church. You don't pull back from believing in Jesus. You just pull back from you being part of something that is helping other people to follow Jesus. You don't, we had a whole bunch of people today. They don't even know if they believe in the local church. They don't even know if they, they, they're, they're all, they can be all in with just Jesus, but not in with this other people thing. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, Lord. Then feed my sheep. I love my people. I need you to be all in again, Peter. I need you to come off the sidelines. I know you put yourself on the sidelines because of your disappointment, because of your heartache, because you were embarrassed in front of everybody. I need you to go all in again. I love people. I see all of eternity. And I need you not to just be safe yourself. I need you to be a fisher of men. I need you to be fully engaged again with my church. So we were at No Regrets and one of the speakers, Pete Driscoll, he had this, he had this glove and he's... Uh, he was telling us about his middle school Sunday school class. And he said, uh, he said, we had a magician as our teacher. He said, every middle schooler needs a magician to be their teacher. He came in and he wowed us with all kinds of sleight of hand tricks. And we, he always had our attention. Well, one day he came in and he had a, he had a magic glove. He holds up the magic glove and he says, this glove is amazing. This glove is able to pick up the Bible. It's a magic glove. Watch this. And he puts the Bible down and he puts the glove on it. And he says to the glove, pick up the Bible. Nothing happens. What's wrong with this thing? Okay. Something's wrong. Pick up the Bible. Huh. Magic glove's not working. So then he goes and he looks at the glove again, but he hides himself from the kids and he says the third time, Pick up the Bible! And he goes over and he, and he, picks, up, he picks up the Bible with the glove. And one of the kids says, What do you think we are, stupid? <laughs> The teacher read Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And he said, guys, the Christian life is not to be lived in your own strength. That's us. That's our ability to be a Christian, our ability to pick up the Bible. We're the glove. The Christian life was supposed to be Christ in us, Christ activating us. This is how you love. This is how you pray for people. This is how you do. This is how you pick up your Bible. It's not you. It's Christ in you. Is it you? Is it the glove? Yeah, it is the glove. But it's really not the glove, is it? It's the hand in the glove. No one gives glory to the glove. The glove isn't the power. It's the hand is the power. Christianity is about Christ in us. 
Christ in us, us learning to trust, trust Jesus Christ in us. Peter, you had to fail because it was all about you. It was all about your own strength. And even though outwardly it might be impressive, you had to fail completely. You can't do agape without me. But Peter, the day is coming. Your brokenness is not the end, Peter. It's not the end. I am calling you to be all in again. Follow me. I know you're broken. I know you've been hurt. I know you've been through things. I know people have disappointed you. I know some of the sheep have bit you. Peter, I'm calling you to go all in again because when I am in you, and this is the plan, I'm going to be in you, Peter. You are able to go places that you don't even want to go. You are able to do things that you didn't, had no idea you could do because in Christ, I can do all things. All right, could we have the worship team come up and if you wouldn't mind bowing your head for a moment. Maybe you are here today and you really believe you're on some type of divine appointment. <laughs> because what I'm talking about is, is you. You've been trying to make your own life work and it hasn't worked. You've been trying to do it your own way and quote, Jesus isn't working for you. <laughs> and today God is speaking to you. Because even though you've sinned, even though you've gone your own way, done your own thing, God's crazy in love with you. So much so that he died for you on the cross. And today, he's knocking at your door. Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Because this is between you and God, I've got every head bowed. But I want to pray for you if that is you. Because somebody prayed with me when I first made my response. If that is you, Jesus is knocking at the door. You want to ask him in to save you. Would you just raise your hand right now, high enough, long enough for me to see it? Got you. Thanks, bro. God bless you. Anybody else? By up raised hand. Okay. Got you, bro. Thank you. Anybody else? By up raised hand. We're going to pray in just a moment. I don't want to miss you if you, if you need to be in on this. I'd like those that raise their hands to uh, put your hand over your heart and pray something like this. Lord, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me and for my sins. Jesus, today you're speaking to my heart. Follow me. Leave everything and be all in for me. Lord, I'm saying yes today. I am saying yes. I don't know what it all means. I can imagine what it means. But I want to be all in for you. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Thank you for coming into my heart and my life and sealing this decision today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's awesome. Could we stand together? If you prayed that prayer for the first time, we've got a little booklet called Discipleship 101 that we want to give you. It's at the Welcome Center. All right, here's the second call, guys. Second and final call. You were all in once. You were all in. You remember being all in and you were going to follow Jesus. You were going to do it and you thought church was great and church people were great and pastors were great and no one could do wrong in your eyes because this is the greatest thing on the planet. And then life happened. And you got hurt by the church. Or maybe you, you did something. You fell in a way that you never thought you would fall. Maybe you used to be up front and doing stuff and then something happened and you just went lower than you ever thought you could go. Maybe you've sinned in ways that maybe Jesus could take you back as a believer and go to heaven, but he certainly can't use me anymore. That's a lie in Jesus' name. God loves you. God never, he never was looking at what you could do. He was always looking at what he could make you. 
and he's just not done making you yet. And your failure and the church's failure and the people's failure, don't get distracted by any of that. Jesus wants you to go all in again. If you've been wounded, he wants to heal you. So if that's you, somewhere in there, you need to go all in again. Would you just open your arms before the Lord and I just want to pray. Lord, you know everybody's story. You know everybody's process. Would you do in these few moments what you did for me at at the dinner table when that man spoke over me? He spoke words from heaven that brought healing to my heart that allowed me to get back up and go all in again. Not just all in with Jesus, but all in with your purpose of winning people to Christ, helping bring people to Christ, of being all in on the plan of God to use broken, regular people to bring in this tremendous harvest that needs to come in. Lord, we give you our pain, we give you our wounds, We give you all of the things in our life that maybe have been a distraction from the most important things. And we hear you today, Jesus, saying, follow me. I will make you what I need you to be, but I need you to follow me. I see that the Lord's kind of pointing some things out to some people of, you need to leave this. When it gets specific like that, Here's my suggestion. Don't overthink it. Just leave it. Just say, yes, Lord. If he's saying leave a relationship, just leave it. If he's telling you to sell something, just sell it. If he's telling you to stop doing something that you've been doing that has been a distraction, just stop it. Seriously, just these things only multiply in your mind and in your heart, and then confusion gets in, and should I or shouldn't I? Don't. Don't do it. Just Just make it. it, I know it's painful, but why not just get it over with? Let the knife go in. Let it be a clean cut. And we can move on with our life. So, Father, I pray for each person you're giving something very specific to. Please, God, we don't want to just be believers. We want to follow Christ. Bless each one today, I pray in Jesus' name. God bless you guys. Hope you can come back for young preachers tonight. Otherwise, we have uh, people at the front to pray if you want more prayer.